assistant and a writing mentor. And so I work with authors kind of pretty much all over the world and I have done for 15 years to help you get your books written and to a publisher on some form or another. Um, and I really go between fiction and nonfiction. So I do do both. Um, and we'll talk a lot about those differences and what's happening and what's in demand as we move into the, the publishing climate talk that we're going to do. Kate. And I'm Kate Emerson. There's a lot of faces here that I don't yet know. I am uh, living location free and have been doing so for five years, which means I have no fixed abode. And I am um, a best-selling author and writing is my world as well as running retreats. And Sarah and I partner on some wonderful, crazy ventures that we get up to around the world. And I have just published my fifth book and have been in marketing mode for that these last couple of months. So before we kick off this, uh, a little bit of a, we've got a bit, bit of visuals to show you along with our trends and um, presentation and just kind of we tapped into the market and what's happening. I just want to remind you, which Kate mentioned, many of you are showing up under the name Renata, who is our assistant. So you're welcome to actually just change your name somehow. If there's a way you can just do that if you want to be identified, which is quite useful. So I'm going to share my screen and you're going to tell me, Kate, um, if people can see it and, and what they can see. Yeah, we've got your screen. If you can maybe just go into full mode. Oh. Great. All right. Okay, so people will keep um, popping in and we're just gonna let them. And are we going to be recording this, Kate? Is it ready? Okay, fabulous. And off we go. So ignore all the pings or whatever. So we really just want to do this. This is really, could be, you know, we have quite a large network of authors and a, most, most of you are, are wanting to be published. And that's why you're here. You're writing a book because you want to get published in whichever form that may be. We won't be able, have time to talk about that tonight, will we, Kate? No, not, no, that's not tonight. Talk. So just a little overview of the things we're going to be talking about. That, uh, what is it? I can't see it. The P's of publishing. And we've got 10. We had a lot more. But we've done this talk before. And we try and do it twice a year after we tap into publishers. And we, we took it down to 10 because we, uh, we know we've got to say we may run out of time. Um, and we are going to just share with you some of the 10 P's. And the very first one, Kate. Ah, oh, purchasing power. So it's, you know, our money counts and the purchasing power rests with readers. It rests with real people. It rests with the publishers. And this was the two of us let loose last year in Waterstones where we went and we were literally scouring the bookshelves. And, you know, I don't know if any of you know it, it's a six story building. It's so beautiful. And we were just bowled over by some of the new sort of genre categories and how books were being displayed. So our money is what buys books and what drives this business. And the reason we really go into bookshops to do research is for one reason and one reason only, and that is that readers buy books. And publishers, all publishers, want one thing, and that is books that sell. So the job of an author is to start to understand the market, the trends, and what readers are buying. And that's why Kate and I spend quite some time exploring different categories, looking at what's coming up now. And I want to say already, and I know we've put on this talk that the 20, the publish, what are publishers looking for in 2021? And I want to tell you already that they are pretty much full. Publishers are looking 2022, 2023. So it was a little bit of a misinformation. We talk, called you into this to try and think you may get a publishing deal this year. But with the really realistic caveat, the publishers are looking ahead. As this quote from Mbali, who is a South African publisher, indicates, they are looking 12 months ahead. What are the trends? What are people buying? And one of the first things we came up with there, and I'm going to hand over to Kate, is this really exciting category. And, you know, this smart thinking, we walked into Waterstones and it was double volume and it was about 12 rows across and it was 18 rows deep at least. And we, were, we, we stood there looking with our mouths open because people are looking for information. They want to think differently. They want to feel differently. They want to live differently. So this is one of the biggest stands that we found in Waterstones. How do we, how do we live the better version of ourselves? And this wonderful 
um, title of examined lives because that's what people want stories of real people memoirs biographies autobiographies sharing from the heart and i know so many of you have got those that you are working through and working with to bring to life and when you stand in those bookshops and you look at what these bestsellers or these sellers are, it's quite remarkable, particularly in the memoir category, how these are often very ordinary people with not even extraordinary stories, but people have thought deeply about their lives. And that is really a trend that publishers have spoken about coming up and is, we'll, we'll show you in some of the lists how that is proving to be what they're looking for. <sighs> So oh, this, so this is, is recent. <laughs> I've just mm. been reading some in interesting statistics and data, and this is Waterstones, if you don't that, like that big bookstore. And Kate Skipper said this, we are looking for sustenance. We're all going through such a torrid time at the moment, and books are a way of helping us live differently, but also escapism as well. So the good news is publishers have never been busier. Um, people are saying there's a downturn, everyone's um, at home, nobody's buying, or well, let us tell you right now that people are buying books. People are buying books. How is that statistic? 200 million print books, right? And this is really interesting because it defies trends, which says people are going online. So we've had a little bit of a reversal. And this accounts for a lot of closures, obviously, during COVID. And in spite of all of that, the sales figures are the highest that they've been in. Can't see because this thing on my screen. 2012. <laughs> and, and this yeah. is a recent figure. So this is 2020. 202 million is the actual number. And the best sellers in the UK, now I don't know you, but I have got this book in my paws in front of me, The Boy, The Mole, The Fox and The Horse. It is kind of a children's book, but it's also under the philosophy category. That is the best seller in the UK last year. Richard Osman is a cozy murder thriller mystery. And then of course we always say cookbooks. So those are the top three current information in the UK. Yeah. So Let's get into, so the first P we spoke about of publishing is, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> if you know us, you know we always laugh. Oh, we're moving on to number two, which is Pulse. The bottom line is, what are the readers, what are your readers looking for? The second thing is, is what are publishers wanting? Their books with a finger on the pulse. Those books that move very, very quickly and this is an example of a this is actually a south african author got a huge deal with penguin new york whipped out a book record speed what is it virus proof your business virus proof your business and i mean he got this to market so fast as COVID hit last year um and it's just being able to just listen and focus and get something out um and that's one of the things you have to be able to just answer quickly and respond and be agile I guess is the word yeah and here's some other books just whipped out straight onto bestseller lists written at a rapid pace I certainly know Douglas Kruger was given three weeks to write that book so all of us who moan about we can't write a book and it's three years and it's two years it's that's how fast he did it here's some books that whipped out so fast got publishing deals out there bestsellers so books that publishers are looking for are very responsive exciting ones on one level um, and they are looking for, and always looking for, people who move fast with these kind of books, politics and current affairs, biographies, so you immediately saw we've got Joe Biden's biography, we've got um, Camilla, we've got a million of them coming out, people who move fast with contemporary history, and by that I mean like recording the elections, for example, what's happened in the most recent past modern history almost um, and then of course big name or celebrity and, and education books and I'm going to talk a lot about these a little bit further down in the talk so this is what publishers have identified they are looking for at the moment coming up Kate so this is obviously um quite recent a lot of the political social issues Black Lives Matter this Bernadine Evaristo I mean just getting unbelievable accolades for her book Remote working is something, you know, I've been doing this for five years, remote working companies shifting into this gear because COVID forced that issue. People had to start dialing in digitally. So all of that parenting, homeschooling, climate change, cryptocurrency has added into the wealth, midlife, anything, whether it's midlife, you know, changing your life or starting your business or the word of last year was pivot. 
Um, and a lot of the vegan movement has been coming out as well. And I don't think these are gonna disappear too soon. So when you're looking always at how do I get published, the one of the biggest answers is look at what is being published. So we're starting to draw your attention to books that are being commissioned, are being published and um, are sitting on shelves currently. Trends in novels. I go back to my favorite thing. So this has been really interesting. The novel, the rise of the novel, 2020 has been the year the novel has again resurged. For many, many decades, nonfiction has been outstripping, moving towards outstrip novels in the sales. And this year, novels have just outsold nonfiction across the board. And what sells in novels, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later down in the course, but the big name genres, and I'm really, which is crime, romance, and thriller. And I'm really going to group it into a word that current publishers are looking for. And those are commercial books. Commercial books are pretty simply put, books that the mass market of reader wants to buy. And the trend here is to be very specifically genre-based. However, there's also some very exciting rising trends in the novel world. The new adult, young adult has been rising for a long time, but it's one of the most commissioned books and bought books um, in the UK, USA markets. The other rising trend has been middle grade fiction, and we've been looking at that for quite some time, placing it. It's a very exciting um, age bracket. It's a David Wallace's, it's the eight to 12-ish age group. It's before your young adult, which is your Harry Potter um, kind of book style. Um, new adult is you're moving into your divergent, uh, your Hunger Games, those, you know, the protagonist being 19 to 25. The other trend in novels that you need to be cognizant of is not, just books about LBGTIQA or transgender, it's characters that are that, right? So we don't necessarily want an entire book tackling these issues, but what is happening more and more is that within your mainstream commercial fiction, your characters are transgender, non-binary, who knows what it is. I just read a Michael Patterson and he has got a transgender character. And I mean, he is the most commercial writer. So we are really moving into the mainstream. And the last thing, and I said this last year, and this is really the spotlight on this, is a, is a um, genre called speculative fiction. A lot of publishers are looking for and actively acquiring speculative fiction. So if you get online and you start to look at hot young agents, what are they looking for? A lot of the time you're going to find it speculative fiction. What is speculative fiction? Um, it's a really big umbrella term publishers are using for sci-fi, fantasy, all these kind of blends, horror, um, with all these elements that just kind of take us out of our ordinary lives and connect us with fantastical worlds and crazy characters. So please start thinking, if you're sitting with a novel in your heart, be thinking along the lines of, these are books that I could start looking at. Kate. So the next one is provocative, which is really, I mean, those titles say it all. And I think Mark Manson was one of the first that was legitimately able to put fuck in the title. And it's a lot of people have now followed suit but it has to match your personality and your brand. But they're wanting things that are a little out there, a little in your face, how to be a boss. You know, it's just having an attitude, having sass, you know, I'm clapping my hands. It's just not being afraid to own who you are, what you believe in, how you want to say it, and just really coming out, you know, with all guns blazing and just showing the world who you are and being a little bit sassy. Uh, sexier, just more in your face. It's also this whole Netflix generation, the gaming generation, even this Pornhub, Instagram influencers, bloggers, and it's just, it's a little bit more larger than life. And you might like it, you might not like it, but it is definitely one of the places that publishers are looking for. They want personality and books and people that sell their books. Mm. So that means push your writing to the edge. And as you know, many of you who've worked with us, we always try and push you hard to have a lot of attitude in your writing. We had time, we'll talk about the different ways you can move it into your writing, but I think that's for another call. But that is something we are looking for. And this was so interesting, Katie, you were, the, you were doing this research as well. Oh, about yes, you know, this is about productivity. So 
absolutely people are spending much more time online which also speaks back to the fact that a lot of readers are going to paperback because they've got screen fatigue and they're tired and they're sick of zoom you know they're just so tired of being online but those you know those five hours are going up and it's that netflix generation where they want you know if you go into netflix i'm sure you all know there are three words that determine that um show that you're about to watch or that movie it is very honed and that's what readers are wanting. They want to know, what is this book about? What am I going to get? How am I going to spend my time? Just like Netflix. Just like Netflix. Such a lovely trend that's coming out. And really, this has been highlighted by not just publishers, but by sales. Um, and that is a trend of positivity. So. I think this also speaks to the word hopeful and mm -hmm. uplifting and heartwarming and just escapism. And this can be in the solutions oriented, you know, so meditation, mindfulness, happiness, being gentle, especially with this last year that we've had, the simplicity, wisdom, but it's also the escapism um, in novels. And there's also another massive genre that is on the rise again. And you're gonna see a wonderful face here that I'm sure you all saw last week, a couple of weeks ago, is Amanda Gorman, that beautiful, young poetess that was at the inauguration and just delivered the hill we climb and Rupi Kaur and just I mean that's a best-selling book I've put Brandon Leake in there um, because he actually won last year's America's Got Talent and he is a spoken poet he is uh, so it's not necessarily books but it's just this world of poetry and just the beautiful word and how we it's evocative and how we respond to it and then Louise Gluck um, at the bottom she was a poetess that won the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature. So there is this wonderful resurgence of poetry and a lot of people have been writing throughout COVID. It's been one of their outlets to sort of transform and make sense of what's been going on around them. And this is very interesting as a publishing trend because for many, many decades, poetry was just not publishable. It was, you know, it was a, it was a sort of, a, 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 a kind gesture to publish a poet and and Rupi Kaur particularly changed that entire market if you don't know who she is you can go and find look her up and poetry is rising and rising with millennials and there is also an ups, a, 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 a rise of insta poetry you know these wonderful sayings shortened on Instagram which has been driving into book sales so that's how we think it's coming through number five of our P's, of what are publishers looking for? Predictability. You know, publishers are looking for it. We love it. When we go and spend our hard-earned money, whether it's online or in the bookstore, and we walk in, we want to know that we're going to get good bang for our buck or buck for our bang. What's it? <laughs> we oh. want to know that we're not going to waste our time, energy, money, or, you know, that we are going to really just be delivered what we were promised. And we all look for that. And unfortunately, and I say the word unfortunately, we look for big names. Mm -hmm. And if you go into very seldom, if you go into a bookshop, let's look at the, the cooking realm, and you want to buy a cooking book, by far, and I don't have the actual figures here, I must pull these figures up, you will be buying a Jamie Oliver over a local, smaller author. It's quite extraordinary. And um, it is about predictability and brand recognition. But the predictability doesn't just go in non-fiction where we know Jamie has good recipes we trust him it goes into fiction and it goes back to the word I used earlier which is commercial genre driven fiction and I mean look these are all um just you know completely <laughs> ridiculous and They're almost interchangeable you know, covers <laughs> all Nicholas Sparks, some of Nicholas Sparks's covers and it's really, and I just want to quickly just backtrack for those of you who haven't heard one of my rants or talks about genre. It's that readers buy by genre. We're going to talk about it a little bit lower. And when you buy a book and you're going for a beach holiday or you're going on a skiing holiday and you've spent your 12 pounds on a book, you really want to know that it's going to deliver what you want. And because time is short and we don't mess around and we don't want to waste time on experimental readers like we did when we were 18 studying law, we want to end up buying the books we know make us feel fabulous. And that's what publishers know. And that's why crime, romance and thrillers outstrip the sales. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> this is your favorite rant. So the <laughs> precision is, oh, you've got to knock this one out of the park. So there's a great lot on the next slide for you, Sarah. 
precision. And what we had in the last slide is your Netflix. The total tightness of what Netflix offers you has moved into all realms of media consumption, books being media in the print form. This precision is about matching your genre, which we've just discussed, your reader, your cover, your title and subtitle, and matching it all with your Amazon keywords. It feels like it takes a little bit of the romance and guessing game out of being an author. And unfortunately, in the modern world of publishing, this is the way books are sold. And this is the way authors are going to have to think as they start to write. And genre drives all buying decisions. When you go on to Amazon or whatever you're buying on Nobu, or even if you walk into a bookshop, already you're being segmented by what you like to buy or read or choose. And when you're an author and you are selling your books, even if you have a very big publisher, this makes no difference. You also are, are listing your books by what readers are browsing for, all right? So, and you can only choose two. I've given you some examples. So what is your book if you're writing? Is it a, you know, a sacred text or is it a motivational nonfiction? So starting to understand that books are sold digitally and through genre is one of the most important things of understanding what publishers are looking for. Um, I'm taking the time. Okay, we've got a bit of time. And I cannot tell you as an agent how often I am pitched books and I will have to obviously take books and pitch them to publishers. And I can see that you don't know what genre your book is in. And this comes mostly in novels. Um, and it comes with people who say, well, it's a novel, but it's true life experience. Or, you know, I am a professional, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm using this um, other person's work as well and confusing and too confusing for publishers at the moment and too confusing for agents. And equally, you know, we've spoken a little bit about novel genres. The tightness of novel genres has got more and more and more segmented. And understanding it as, as an author, I mean, I'm always gonna say to you, cho choose a publishable genre. Please don't tell me you've written a Western. Please don't tell me you've written a, you know, a pulp thriller because we, it's hard to sell these books in the current publishing climate. And if you do choose your genre, please understand the conventions and what readers are looking for in those books. And if you get it and you write it and you can perfectly position it, you are going to start to move your way towards publication by tightening all of the genre. And final, Kate, I'm going to leave this one to you because you are a little bit of an Amazon wizard. Oh, no, th this is an ever-changing landscape. Amazon's algorithms change constantly it is a minefield but when you upload your book you get up to seven keywords that describe it and actually with amazon almost every six to eight weeks ideally you are changing those because it's like the algorithms get bored but that is what you're allowed and that is what drives sales it's what drives ads your sponsored ads to your book it what drives recommendations reviews so these are vital part of how your book gets processed and uploaded onto Amazon or all of the, the other platforms that sell them. But it's a very, it's very complex and complicated and it's a whole world in and of itself, how books are sold using keywords and categories. And of course, the mainstream publishers are just geniuses at this and they understand this. And as an author, when you're pitching or when you're wanting a publishing deal, be clear that this is what you're offering. We're offering a how to write a book guide, a writing resource. This is our book, of course. Um, and just in case you really thought you had any choice at all as a consumer or as a reader, we also have the most fabulous other mechanism, which is your, your recommendations. So you've also seen that, of course. There you are browsing to buy a speaker, Bose speaker, and you get this fabulous ad that comes up. You can see what I read because clearly this is <laughs> my recommendations. So they can see this reader likes crime. So everywhere I go, what's being suggested to me is crime. Um, and somebody, your, your wish list is going to, or your recommendations are going to look very different to mine. 
So and one of the ways around this, Sarah, is when you're going and doing some research for yourself, when you think, okay, I love that book, that novel, what genre is it in? Go either incognito into your browser or at least log out of Amazon and go in, clear your cookies and go in as a clean browser so that they don't have your history or your profile to kind of funnel you down one specific way. So go and be a little more anonymous to go and do some research for yourself. And your wish lists, and just to, to add, your wish lists and your reading tastes change very, very dramatically as you move through life. You know, so you're interested in spirituality, and then you're interested in making money, and then you're interested in managing your money midlife, and then you're interested in, in retirement. So, so, you know, we're not fixed in what we buy, but when we are buying that, we know what we want, and we're looking for it. So that's important to know as well. <sighs> One of my favorite topics. So this is really interesting. What are publishers looking for? They're looking for books that sell and sell and sell and sell. And this is really hard, you know, both as an agent and, and as a publisher. And I don't know if there's any publishers on this call. They often are. You know, all publishers are trying to make an estimate on how many books you are going to sell. Something like Douglas Kruger's, which was virus proof your, what was that, your business, Look, that book is not going to be on the shelf 20 years from now. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki's book has been in the bestseller list for, I think it's 30 years. Um, I, 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 can, I must double check. So the brain is not functioning this, this evening. I don't know why. Um, Sarah, I so, think there's actually 40 books in that class now with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And you know what? His books are timeless. All publishers are looking for books that are going to be selling 10 years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, hopefully 15. Um, so they are timeless. And, you know, whenever I say, when all the authors tell me they want to be published, I say to them, write a textbook. <laughs> not glamorous, not what you want to hear, but the best, biggest selling category most often is educational books. Write a textbook. Or anything that becomes a prescribed text in the schooling, college, or education system. Unbelievable book sales. Um, outstrips most of them. Again, let me not bang this drum too hard, but your <laughs> fiction. <laughs> Just slide <Kate>. forward. <laughs> Move forward, Kate's like, take that slide out, Sarah. Come on. <laughs> Just want to show you what we mean. So these. Of the Amazon best seller list. This was a few weeks ago. Look at what we've got here. There we have JK Rowling yet again, right? 178 weeks on the, the list. How many years is that? Um, then we have another Stephanie Mayer. Then we've got somebody on the left field. And then I just want to just keep showing you how these perennial sales look at that. Dan Brown, these are the 100 best selling titles of all time. Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code, 5 million copies of his book sold to date look at the genre guys this column that we want all of you to understand and be able to fit into and then look at this guys isn't this ridiculous jk rowling oops jk rowling jk rowling jk rowling and down there jk rowling i mean crazy stuff children's fiction which is one of your other perennials the reason being, just um, Kate, stop me, is children's books are widely read. When you're young, you still got an active mind. Often books are prescribed. You've got to meet reading lists. So any children's book is a high, often a high sales volume. To date, the bestseller, I think, globally ever is still in Blyton. Three, I think 300 million copies of a book sold. Um, so this was actually just the same list. And I, was, I wanted to show you how many of the top books is actually, are J.K. Rowling. Kate. Right, so our next P is polished. So often we think that it's got to be perfect. It's got to be five million degrees professional. It doesn't. What publishers are looking for, what agents are looking for when you query them is that you've got a really good book, but you've got a polished pitch. And that just means that at the very basic level that you have done your homework, that you have checked that when you are pitching to them, that they actually are accepting submissions, first of all. It sounds like no brainer, but people don't do it. Are they actually representing your genre? And what are the competitive titles? And also, are they a good fit for you? Because you can send off the most polished proposal, but if they're not a good fit for you, you're wasting your time and energy. But part of being polished is also about knowing the done 
is better than perfect. Having sat down and put the hours in and done your query letter and your proposal and your three chapters and your homework and oh, you press send and it's terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. But sending those first ones off and then you send 20 off and 50 off because it is a numbers game. But sending it off is always better than going, oh, let me just do it one more time and let me perfect it. Because those are the books that never leave your computer, that stay in your heart and never get read. And that's not what readers are looking for. They need your book. So polish it, make it professional, love it and send it out. And I want to add to that, that um, I've done quite a lot of pitching actually in the last sort of six months to publishers. And what, what you have to understand as an author is that if a publisher likes your book, they will see the potential in it, even if they want you to change it. So what's happened very frequently actually with pitches is that we've pitched a book and the publisher's gone, I like it, but it's not quite right. Can you segment it? Can this only be for women? Or um, so for example, I'm gonna give an example of Megan DeBayer's book, which is um, Raising Strong, How to Raise a Man. So initially the question was, should this be about how to raise a teenager, which is her realm as a psychologist, um, working with teenagers. And after a lot of conversation between the publisher, myself as the agent and the author, we decided that to segment the book into how to raise boys, okay? So these are decisions you may in the writing of the book not yet have taken, but a publisher may come back to you. So that's why getting your book out there when it's good enough, so please notice the word good, you know, it's good enough, um, is also the, a, a very important next step because you are testing what the market's actually looking for. Um, terrifying as it is. Mm. Positioning. So this is very much for the memoir nonfiction um, categories. It's all about who are you? What is your presence? What is the way you authentically show up? They want to know that you are going to get behind your book. This is Gabby Lowe. For those of you in South Africa, you absolutely know the story of her daughter, Jenna Lowe, and the foundation they started and her ultimate death from her disease. And Gabby was just able to get a publisher and she has just rocked this book and her story and shared it from the heart. But, you know, she went at this with a very sort of sassy, clever, the story was poignant, but Gabby also has a brand and she positioned herself correctly in the market and the publishers snapped her up. And more than, yeah, more than only just that, is it's also the fact that readers and publishers are looking for authenticity. They're looking for very real, very relatable people and in and accessible people, people who are going to sit on a stage, going to sit at book clubs, available to readers. It's quite a different market. It's actually been exposed more and more by kind of our online social media presence. And actually, when we pitch books to publishers, publishers are very much looking at who you are more than what you say. And that's quite hard to get your head around. So some of you sitting on this call could be that. You could be a brand. You could have already built this, this thing that we called an author brand or, or a person brand or an influence brand. Um, in which case, publishers will buy in just on your figures. And I'm not going to name a name, but I have just finished ghostwriting a book because that's my other job. So I write celebrity books. And, you know, the celebrity sent a one page about what she was going to be, um, you know, what the book was about, an aspect of her life. And the publisher said, How absolutely fantastic. Can you deliver the book in six months? Um, why did they do that? Because she has 250,000 Instagram followers. So and that's not to terrify those of you that don't have that, but they want to know that you're willing to stand behind your brand, that you've got something to say, that you can speak it from the heart. But ultimately, publishing is a business. Of course, they want good stories, but they want to know that they can make their money back and that they're going to get traction with your book in the market because they take a risk on you. And the break even with the publisher is often to sell 2000 copies. And thereafter, they sort of, they know that you're, you know, you're a viable uh, financial model for them. And, you know, if you, if you sell 2 million, like um, 
one of those authors on that list, not J.K. Rowling, she sold more, you know, unbelievable bonus for everybody there. But the statistics show that the average number of books across all realms, published, self-published, traditionally published, digitally published, the number of books most authors sell is 50. As you all gasp into your <laughs> wine or gin and tonic or tea. <laughs> Let's take a long sip of water <laughs> at that point. Yeah. And this is just the most important thing if you want to be a published author. Gosh, this is honestly is just the hardest thing because the thrill of writing, it's so fun. Then it's hard. Then it's discipline. Then it's a bit of a, a pain to get all your stitching together. And then you send it out. And then you send it out 10 times. And then you send out 20 times and nobody gets back to you. And, you know, this question of what does it take to keep going um, is such a huge thing with authors. And every single one of the authors we've worked with over the last 10, 15 years, this has been a place that is so hard to keep going, is when nobody says yes, well, what do you do? And one of the challenges with this is that you might hear about that one time where, you know, that author put one pitch and it got picked up by the first publisher, but that's not the norm, you know, so you have to be able to dig deep and have a community of writers and have a support team, be building your author brand where it's important, be writing, be blogging, be doing everything you can to keep up your creativity and never lose faith, because often it's about timing, you just need the right book to the right publisher at the right time. And it's also about what is that publisher commissioning? Because it might be different. It's like, you know, when on the movies, we see the, they're all pitching their stories to the editor and it's just like, yes, that's the right one for now. So just because it's been refused or just, you know, maybe it's just not yet. And you have to just be willing to dig deeper and go at it again. And one of the things we often see is that because of, like Sarah said, the writing is the, the fascinating creative part is throwing baby number one out and starting with baby number two before number one has been birthed to the world. And that is because it's quite addictive to get into the writing mode and it's often quite um, disillusioning to get into the how am I going to get published how am I now going to sell these books when they are published because that's the the next step so don't give up one book and just you know flip to the next one that's too easy you've got to be persistently putting this book out there putting all the love behind it so that it gets picked up by the right person absolutely yeah and um just a beautiful quote to remind you all that mm. writing is a long game it really is a long game it's not like you're bashing out an article for a newspaper it's not like you're writing a research paper you know writing a book is a big endeavor um and there is sometimes urgency as we saw in the pulse category but that's not the norm most often bo books are thought out they have brewed inside you for a very long time um, and they are crafted and then sent into the world in that form, a form that a reader can digest in the most entertaining and exciting way because that is what we do as authors. We are there to entertain people and we are sometimes there often to give them the information they are looking for, two totally different callings. So there are two reasons. And then doing that to the best of your ability. So it is easy to place, potentially publishable, and can be read by the most number of people. And we'll tell you about that in a sec. Oh, Once yes, we'll stop the blast, blast your book. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about that now. Yes. I think, Sarah, we've done pretty well with the timing. It's quarter two, almost quarter two. Although so maybe we can go over to questions um, mm. and actually see if we can answer some stuff right now. I see there's a chat. Let's see that question. Yeah, oh. so please pop your questions in the chat or you can, gosh, how do we, un, how do we see if somebody wants to put your little handy yeah, thing up? You know, you know, you'll raise your hand, um, you know, at the bottom, <laughs> of your, bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so Shams is saying best-seller non-fiction. There's just some that were included in that list, Shams, um, you know, in England. Uh, I don't know, Sarah, if you've got a, a list of the best non-fiction. But also you can just Google very quickly. Just go and Google best Amazon. You know, it's very easy to 
get that by a lovely friend, Google. Yeah, and you know, yeah. So the bestseller list, you know, we get the various bestseller lists done by various rating agencies, and they and they do change and shift. The ones I shared with you, actually, those are the fiction ones, were the best in a hundred years. But nonfiction is often more time specific. Nonfiction can often be very political, current affairsy. So from week to week, it can actually change. Okay, so Tess in Norway says it's hard to know when a book's good enough to send it out would you pay an editor before you send it to agents and she writes commercial women's fiction yes okay that's a great question um it is so hard to know because what happens is when you've reread and you've edited a book and you've cut and you've pasted that same material and those same characters all over you can't see the wood for the trees you can't see the pacing and the plot so um, I always believe that with a novel, it's the job of an author to get it to the best possible version you can and then send it out. So absolutely, the answer is no, you will not pay an editor before you send it to an agent. Definitely not. The role of an editor is very different and maybe we'll come back to that. But what you can do, Tess, is if you feel like something's wrong, it's, you're not getting traction, the book's just not working, it's not gelling, you can do something we love to uh, recommend is have a manuscript appraisal. And that really is with a professional. So we we use we have a, a lot of people who come via us. So it's usually a senior editor or it can be a publisher who's doing it on the side, who's a specialist in your genre. And they will give you a big report. They're gonna say things like, cut that entire storyline out. You're missing a subplot. Um, you know, the huge structural changes you can make to your book or not. They may just send you small things to improve your book. Um, so that's the one thing. And I guess you, you never really know if your book is good enough. And I just want to send, tell you that my every time I write a book for a client, be a celebrity memoir or before I wrote a thought leadership book, which is my 11th, and the minute before I pressed send, I promise I was in a cold sweat. It was just like, this is absolute rubbish. Why did I even think this was good, right? So we all have that. Nobody thinks their good book's good enough. And um, the, the thing to know about novels is novels have a magic. Um, with nonfiction, we can predict sales to a degree, but there's something different with a novel. Who would have ever thought Fifty Shades of Grey would be literally on the top 100 of all time? Have any of you actually read that book? So um, we don't know. There's something magical that happens when you release a novel and we can't always tell. So publishers also don't know and they can take a good guess. Um, but it is up to readers at the end of the day. Sarah, so just to answer Tess's second part is how do you find them? So often you can go to... Um, your writing community because maybe whoever you're working with or maybe it's Sarah and I might have that network. So we do that for people. We facilitate mm -hmm. because it's about the right um, professional appraiser for your book and your genre. It's like that right connectivity, like dating, you know? Um, you don't just want to send it out to anybody. It's the same as with beta readers, which are a notch down and very different from a professional manuscript appraisal. Um, and we always say, don't really ask your friends or your family or your partner because they will find it probably very hard to give you objective advice they've been sitting there watching you blood sweat and tears and again it's like asking the beta reader to do the right thing but always go to your community first you're all part of our writing community or maybe another writing community or a couple um, but it's also what you pay for it's like you get what you pay for yeah the other thing when you get a manuscript appraisal sorry i just wanted to say is that you will be taught how to be a better writer because they will be saying, this is what you've got to go and do X, Y, and Z. And then you will go and do X, Y, and Z. So you'll learn in the process. Whereas when your book has been edited, it's mostly largely done for you. That's what you're paying your editor for. So it's just knowing the different kind of subtleties between the layers um, and knowing if you're going to a publisher, where should you spend your money, but you're not going to pay it to edit it because they're going to do that. And they're going to want their in-house editors, their best editors, proofreaders to do your book. So you're wasting your money to do it before you go to a publisher. Yeah, and I may come back to when is the, when you get an editor. So, so, so Renata, who it's clearly not Renata because she's our <laughs> assistant, said the book I'm submitting is the, is set in, I'm assuming it's a novel set in the Cold War period. 
my style is from that period. No, you don't necessarily want to change it to a more modern writing style because historical fiction is a huge and very publishable genre. Um, and readers of historical fiction, because that's a very tight genre, like you like historical fiction. So maybe it's the, you know, the Philippa Gregory's or whatever it may be, or the um, Wolf Halls and all those fabulous uh, Mantel books. Um, you know, readers want to be immersed in the Cold War. They don't want to feel that they're sitting in ice cold, you know, um, Japan, you know, uh, eating a cold McDonald's takeaway. They want to believe that they are immersed in a game of espionage. And that really is the job of what we call world building in a book, is the job of an author in a novel is to absolutely take a reader out of their real life. Um, and that's the rise. That's why novels have soared. Is, you know, our real lives are pretty mundane right now. So if we can be in the Cold War, or if we can be back in 16th century, you know, swashbuckling Ireland with a, you know, gorgeous lad. Okay, what was that book you started reading? The, the um, Outlander, oh, goodness God. gracious. Okay. I was in Scotland. I was absolutely besotted and immersed and up all night. I was on the, a little, literally a little remote island and I was like just drooling and salivating and just wandering around the highlands with these wonderful characters. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so, so really absolutely not, you know, you want us to. And, you know, just to take it a step further, you often get a book where they actually write in a accent, you know, and I don't know if you've ever read that, and it can be a little disconcerting initially, but what actually happens in your brain is it tends to pull you a little bit into the world a little bit deeper. <laughs> you know, and one well, of my I favorite uh, authors, <laughs> one of my favorite authors, Jeffrey Deaver, says when you start his books or any novel, you know, by the first end of the first chapter, he wants to have grabbed you by your lapels and dragged you into the car with him. And he's not going to let you out until he gets you to the destination he wants. So it's about grabbing somebody out of a very mundane life and pulling them into a wonderful, you know, altered realm, which is why we call the world of story a magical world. And we ask readers to when they enter story with us to walk the bridge and across the threshold from the normal world into the world of story. Mm -hmm. And the job of the author is to build that world. And I think part of that, I remember in the last call, someone said, what makes a good writer? Well, you have to be a good reader. So, you know, you probably know your genre really well. When you're in the writing phase, we always say one of Sarah's famous rules is don't read within your genre when you're in the writing mode. But for the rest of the time, you've got to be an avid reader in order to be a great writer. Mm -hmm. So in those down times, make sure that you've got a book next to your bed and that you're spending time like just immersing yourself in someone else's story, not just your own. Yes. How about some more questions? We've got some time. Um. Kate, I wanted to just pick up on what you said, and it, it links back to what our publisher is looking for. And we said the word, did we say the word attitude? It was, what was the? Yeah, provocative. Under, under, um, yeah. Provocative. Yeah. And, and yeah. The, the other flip side of that, if you're writing a nonfiction, is publishers want you to have an opinion. You know, they don't want you to kind of sum up a general trend. They want you to have an edge. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if, if everybody, for example, is writing a book about a how to get rich quick, and you come to a publisher with a book about how to get rich slowly. Mm. They're gonna go. And on that, we, we mentioned um, Douglas Kruger earlier. He, he's got a new one that's just been released about the about political correctness. I don't have the full title in my brain, but it's a very provocative nudging title saying how being too politically correct is damaging. You know, so it's very kind of in your face and positional and that's what publishers want. So don't be afraid to be positional. Of course, it's also got to match kind of your personality a little bit. So if you're in one lane and you suddenly jump to another and there isn't a, a match, it's like when people put swearing in their title and it's not part of their escrow, it's not part of their energy. And they're trying to do it because they think it's trendy and they're trying to speak like that, but it's not actually what their book is really like or about, or it's not the tone of their book. So all those bits have to match. Yeah. 
And so if there are no more questions, and I thought saw somebody maybe putting their hand up, I don't know, somebody speaking, I want to just mention that there are many things you can do with Kate and myself in the realm of writing. Um, we run quite a big writing network and we are here to support writers. So the one thing we really want to encourage you to do is our Blast Your Book, which is the 30 day madcap push. Some of the writers on here I know have already done one version of it. It is just spectacular. So for 30 days, you get like a push to finish a project, whatever you are working on. It could be a, a first um, draft, could be your second, third, seventh draft. It could be your pitch deck. It could be submissions or some people use it to boost a massive Amazon campaign. Um, so that's one thing. And um, also um, join one of our writing internships if you want to work on a more long, sustained and slow basis to get your book and of course, the other thing, I think it's the dreaded word at the moment is <laughs> retreat, because that means getting on a plane and traveling. And oh God, every time Sarah and I talk, we'll talk about all the work and we'll say, are we going to Greece this year? Are we going to Italy? So just that's one of the most wonderful things you can do for yourself, whether you take yourself off on a retreat and immerse. It's about the carving out the time and letting yourself dedicate, whether it's two days or three days, or just find a way to get away from your world Whatever that means, you know, if it means going and shutting yourself in your room and leaving kids and husband and wife outside, but find a way to take that energy of retreating, which is about immersion and dedication, and that you have a really big goal for that time, because it's like when you've carved it out, every part of you starts working towards that goal. So see if you can find a way to do that for yourself this year in some form, whatever form that is. Thank you, all the beautiful people. I'm reading all these lovely comments. And thank you, Angie, bold and sassy. And that is what you are. And that is what your book's going to be. And that's the word that we all love, bold and sassy and attitude. And I always tell people that when I was writing some of my first few books, I always had an attitude mentor who I put above my desk this picture of somebody who I wanted to have their attitude in my book. So find that if you are working on a book and find your own way and it's your own race at your own pace and we are here to support you so please reach out and we'll send you the link tomorrow um for the blast your book if you want to join or you know yeah whatever else we're doing we'll also send you the recording for this just so that you've got it if you would like it and if you don't want it don't save it to your computer <laughs> Well, everybody, thank you for giving us this hour of your time. We hope you've got something out of it and mostly just to be inspired to carry on with your beautiful writing journey for each of you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Petros! <laughs>